uh, special warfare in North Carolina, uh, invaded the uh, Jesuit University in El Salvador, and uh, brutally uh, murdered six leading Latin American intellectuals, uh, Jesuit priests, along with their housekeeper and their daughter, uh, all under orders of the uh, uh, government, which was very closely linked to the United States, uh, following direct orders. Uh, that uh, culminated a decade of uh, horrors, in which began when the archbishop, who was called the voice for the voiceless, uh, was assassinated by much the same hands. Uh, during that period, about 70,000 people were killed uh, in uh, El Salvador, uh, overwhelmingly by the US armed and trained forces. About twice that number were killed uh, elsewhere in Central America in the same years, same source. Uh, the primary targets were the people's organizations fighting to defend their most fundamental human rights. Those are the words of the assassinated archbishop uh, days before he was killed while saying mass, pleading in vain in a letter to Jimmy Carter, uh, pleading for the end of US military aid to the murderous uh, uh, junta. Uh, to serious scholarship in the West, and of course to the victims, it's well known, I'm quoting now, that between 1960 and the Soviet collapse in 1990, the number of political prisoners, torture victims, and executions of nonviolent political dissenters in Latin America vastly exceeded those in the Soviet Union and East European satellites. And I can add, of course, the hundreds of thousands of people who were simply slaughtered. Uh, all of this supported or tolerated by Washington included many religious martyrs, uh, such as those who framed the horrible decade in El Salvador, uh, and uh, mass slaughter as well. Well, actually, I'm quoting well-known Latin Americanist John Coatsworth in the uh, recently published Cambridge History of the Cold War. Uh, Coatsworth picks the year 1960 for good reasons. Now, there had been, of course, uh, many similar horrors in earlier years, but the U.S. crusade against democracy and human rights in the Western Hemisphere uh, escalated very sharply uh, right at that time, uh, right after Vatican II in 1962. And 19, that was a historic event, in the words of uh, distinguished theologian Hans Kuhn, it ushered in a new era in the history of the Catholic Church. Uh, the, uh, it was an effort to restore the Christianity of the Gospels uh, that had been what Christianity was in its first few centuries, which is why Christians were persecuted, but ended when the Roman Empire took it over and turned it into the church of, uh, of the persecutors, not the persecuted in the fourth century. Uh, so this was an attempt to restore the Christianity of the Gospels. And uh, inspired by that, uh, Latin American bishops uh, uh, adopted what they called the preferential option for the poor. Uh, priests, nuns, laypersons uh, tried to take the radical pacifist uh, message of the Gospels to uh, the poor and the persecuted uh, of the hemisphere, people who were, and uh, 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 try to organize them in what were called base communities, uh, and uh, uh, urge them, try to help them take their fate in their own hands and work together to overcome the misery of survival in the harsh realms of uh, US power. Uh, this was recognized at once to be an intolerable heresy, and the reaction was very swift the Kennedy administration immediately helped install a vicious uh, national security state in Brazil. Plague then spread throughout the continent in ways which should be familiar. It uh, culminated exactly when the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, these events have uh, been uh, disappeared, to borrow the terminology used in Latin America. Uh, they suffer from a fallacy, the fallacy of wrong agency, that we carried them out. Therefore, they cannot be in history. And uh, you don't study them in school, you don't read about them, people don't write about them, and so on. 
Uh, we write about our nobility and supporting the uh, Eastern European dissidents who surely suffered, but not even remotely like what was going on in our own domains. Uh, and I should add that horrible as these events were, uh, they're barely a pea on a mountain as compared with other crimes in that period, uh, notably the Indochina Wars that uh, followed from Kennedy's invasion of South Vietnam almost exactly 50 years ago. Uh, it's also been disappeared for the same reasons, fallacy of wrong agency. Uh, a careful look reveals that the grand area doctrines continue to apply to contemporary crises, uh, take what's considered the main one, in Western policymaking circles and uh, among political commentators, uh, the Iranian threat is considered to pose the greatest danger to world order and hence must be the primary focus of uh, US foreign policy, Europe's trailing along politely as usual. Uh, this year is called the year of Iran because of the danger of that enormous threat, uh, which does raise a question. What exactly is the Iranian threat? Uh, if you read the public commentary, you don't get much of an answer, but there actually is an authoritative answer, uh, which is ignored. Uh, the authoritative answer is provided by the regular reports to Congress by the Pentagon and US intelligence agencies come every year, reports on uh, the global, global security. And of course, they include a section on Iran. Most recent was uh, almost a year ago. Uh, the re reports make it very clear that whatever the Iranian threat is, it's not military. It's all quote. Uh, Iran's uh, military spending is relatively low compared to the rest of the region. In fact, it's less than a quarter of that of Saudi Arabia and minuscule as compared with the US, of course. Uh, it's uh, Iran's military doctrine is strictly defensive, uh, designed to slow an invasion and to force a diplomatic solution to hostilities. Iran has only limited capacity to project force beyond its borders. They, of course, bring up the nuclear option and say that uh, Iran's nuclear program and its willingness to keep open the possibility of developing nuclear weapons is a central part of its uh, deterrent strategy. Well, the brutal clerical regime in Iran is undoubtedly a major threat to its own people, though it hardly outranks US allies in that regard. Uh, but the threat lies elsewhere, and it's ominous. The one element of the threat is Iran's potential deterrent capacity. Notice that that's an illegitimate exercise of sovereignty because it might interfere with US freedom of action in the region. And it's, of course, glaringly obvious why Iran would seek a deterrent capacity. Just take a look at the disposition of forces in the region, including nuclear forces. Uh, seven years ago, one of Israel's leading military historians, Martin von Krefeld, wrote that the world has witnessed how the United States attacked Iraq for, as it turned out, no reason at all. Uh, had the Iranians not tried to build nuclear weapons, they would be crazy, uh, particularly when they're under constant threat by uh, uh, constant threat of attack by the United States, of course, in violation of the UN Charter, but remember that that doesn't apply to the United States. Whether they are, in fact, developing a nuclear capability, we don't really know, but uh, perhaps so. Well, the Iranian threat, as described in the documents and the reports, goes beyond deterrence. Uh, Iran is also seeking to expand its influence in neighboring countries and thus uh, to, to uh, destabilize uh, the region, as it's called. Uh, notice that when the U.S. Invade and uh, invades and occupies Ir Iran's neighbors, uh, that's stabilization. Uh, when Iran tries to expand its influence, say commercial relations with its neighbors, that's destabilization. That is absolutely routine usage in foreign policy commentary. So for sometimes it becomes almost comical. Here's uh, 
prominent foreign policy analyst, uh, James Chase, former editor of foreign affairs, rather on the liberal side, incidentally, uh, he was properly using the term stability in its technical sense when he explained that in order to achieve stability in Chile, it was necessary to destabilize the country, uh, <laughs> namely by overthrowing the elected Allende government, installing a vicious dictatorship. Sounds contradictory, but it isn't if you understand the technical meaning of the terms. Uh, well, other concerns about Iran, I have no time to go into. They're interesting to explore, uh, but I think they simply show, uh, underscore what the guiding doctrines are and their, their continuing status in imperial culture. Uh, that's very much in accord with the doctrines that were laid down by uh, FDR's planners back in, during the uh, Second World War. Uh, the United States cannot tolerate any exercise of sovereignty that interferes with its global designs. And uh, the United States and Europe are, of course, engaged in uh, punishing Iran for its threat to stability and trying to get it to become a more civilized country. Uh, but it's useful to recall how isolated the US and Europe are. Uh, the non-aligned countries, which is most of the world, uh, they have uh, for years been vigorously supporting Iran's a right to enrich uranium. Uh, within the region, as I mentioned, uh, the irrelevant public uh, even strongly favors Iranian nuclear weapons. Uh, the major regional power, Turkey, voted against the latest US sanctions motion in the Security Council, along with Brazil, uh, which is the most admired country of the South, as polls show. Uh, Turkey's disobedience it led to sharp censure at that point, but not for the first time. Uh, Turkey was bitterly condemned in 2003 when the government uh, committed a major crime. It followed the will of 95% of the population and refused to take part in the US-British invasion of Iraq. And uh, that demonstrated its very weak grasp of democracy, which led to <laughs> sanctions and uh, sharp censure. Uh, same today, after the 2010 Security Council misdeed, uh, Turkey was warned by Obama's top diplomat on European affairs, Philip Gordon, that it must demonstrate its, com its commitment to partnership with the West, follow orders in other words. Uh, a scholar with the Council on Foreign Relations asked, uh, how do we keep the Turks in their lane? They're departing, you know, something wrong. Uh, in their lane means following orders, like good Democrats, our style Democrats. Uh, Brazil's uh, Lula it was admonished in a New York Times uh, headline. Uh, he uh, was warned that his effort with Turkey to provide a solution to the uranium enrichment issue outside the framework of US power is a spot on the Brazilian leader's legacy. In brief, do what we say. That's your function. It's kind of an interesting sidelight to all of this, which has been effectively suppressed. Uh, the Iran-Turkey-Brazil deal uh, had been approved in advance by President Obama, uh, presumably on the assumption that uh, it wouldn't fail and that would provide an ideological weapon against Iran. Uh, that was revealed by the British Foreign Office, which released the letter of support for it after Brazil was censured. Uh, when the uh, effort succeeded, uh, uh, approval quickly turned to censure, and Washington rammed through a Security Council uh, resolution, which was so weak that China readily signed, and is now chastised uh, for living up to the letter of the resolution but not following Washington's unilateral directives, which go far beyond it. That's the current issue of foreign affairs, the main establishment foreign affairs journal. Well, while the US can tolerate Turkish disobedience, though with dismay, China is harder to ignore. So the press, New York Times, warns that uh, China's investors and traders are now filling a vacuum in Iran as businesses from many other nations, especially in Europe, pull out. 
in fear of the United States. Uh, and in particular, it's expanding its dominant role in Iran's uh, energy industries. All of this is quite in accord with the UN resolutions, but inconsistent with the more extreme US demands, which have no legal authorization other than what's granted by power. Uh, the, it's, it's interesting to watch the Washington reactions, reacting with a, a touch of desperation. So the State Department warned China that if it wants to be accepted in the international community, that's incidentally another technical term that refers to the US and whoever happens to agree with it at the moment, uh, if China wants to be accepted in the international community, it must not skirt, skirt and evade international responsibilities, which are clear, namely follow US orders. Uh, China, unlikely to be impressed. I suspect this led to some amusement in the Chinese foreign offices. Uh, there's also a lot of concern about the growing Chinese military threat. A uh, Pentagon study that recently came out warned that China's military budget is now approaching one-fifth of what the Pentagon spends to operate and carry out the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's, of course, a small fraction of the US military budget. Uh, China's expansion of uh, military forces, it points out, might deny the ability of American warships to operate in international waters off its coast. Uh, off its coast, China's coast. It's yet to be, uh, I haven't come across a proposal that, uh, uh, that, uh, that the US uh, might uh, eliminate military forces that would deny uh, the ability of Chinese warships to operate in the Caribbean. Of course, this fundamental asymmetry. Uh, China's lack of understanding of the rules of international civility uh, is illustrated further by its uh, objections to US plans uh, to uh, send the advanced aircraft carrier, uh, George Washington, to take part in joint naval operations a few miles off China's coast, apparently, allegedly, with capacity to strike uh, uh, Be Beijing with uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, in contrast, the US understands that such operations are undertaken to defend stability and US security. And this is discussed in the strategic analysis literature. It's pointed out that uh, this is what, what they call a classic security dilemma. Uh, each side sees vital interest at stake off the coast of China. Uh, the liberal New Republic expresses its concern about the hardliners who now run China's foreign policy. And the most severe charge is that China sent 10 warships through international waters uh, just off the Japanese island of Okinawa, while Chinese naval helicopters flew dangerously close to Japanese ships. And that is indeed a provocation, uh, unlike the fact, unmentioned, uh, that Washington has converted the island into a major US military base uh, in defiance of uh, uh, ve vehement protests by the people of Okinawa who are as irrelevant as the people of the Arab world. Now, that's not a provocation by the standard principle that we own the world. Uh, well, putting aside deep-seated imperial doctrine, uh, there's good reason for China's neighbors to be concerned about its growing military and commercial power. And although Arab public opinion supports a, an Iranian nuclear weapons program, uh, I don't think we should do so. Actually, the foreign policy literature is full of proposals as to how to counter the threat of an Iranian uh, nuclear program. Uh, one obvious way to do so is not discussed uh, namely, work to establish a nuclear weapons-free zone in the region. Now, that issue has arisen repeatedly. Uh, it arose again at the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference last May. Uh, uh, Egypt, which was chair of the non-aligned countries, in their name, uh, it proposed that the conference call for negotiations on a Middle East 
nuclear weapons-free zone, as indeed had been agreed by the West, including the US, at the 1995 review conference. Nothing had been done. Actually, international support for this is so overwhelming that President Obama was compelled to agree formally uh, while uh, insisting that this is not the right time and insisting that Israel be exempted. And of course, the US, which is self-exempted from international obligations, as I already mentioned. Uh, so uh, Washington informed the conference that it's got nice idea, but not now. It has to wait for a comprehensive peace settlement. And furthermore, no proposal can call for Israel's nuclear programs to be placed under the auspices of the uh, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency or, for, call for, or can call for release of information about Israeli nuclear facilities and activities. Uh, other than these conditions, it's a fine idea. It's uh, rarely noted that uh, the United States and Britain have a very special responsibility to work to establish a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East. When the US and Britain uh, tried to concoct a thin legal cover for the invasion of Iraq, they appealed to a Security Council resolution Resolution 687 in 1991, uh, which called on Iraq to terminate its uh, development of uh, weapons of mass destruction. Well, we can put aside the claim, uh, but the resolution does commit its signers, the US and Britain, uh, to work to establish a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. So the US and Britain have a special, unique responsibility for this. Uh, parenthetically, parenthetically, we can add that U.S. insistence on maintaining nuclear facilities in Diego Garcia uh, undermines another nuclear weapons-free zone, the African one. They regard that as part of Africa. Uh, Diego Garcia, as you should know, is a particularly important case. Uh, Britain obediently followed orders and expelled the population from the island so that the United States could set up a major military base, which is used, in fact, it's used for bombing the Middle East and Central Asia. It's been expanded under Obama to accommodate nuclear submarines and also a deep penetration bombs uh, aimed at Iran. And that's a program that languished under Bush, but was taken up with enthusiasm as soon as uh, uh, Obama took office and has been considerably accelerated. Well, while grand area doctrine still prevails, the capacity to implement it has declined. The peak of US power was after World War II, when, as I said, the US had literally half the world's wealth. That naturally declined. Uh, other industrial countries reconstructed uh, from the devastation of the war. Decolonization took its rather agonizing course. And by the early 1970s, the US share of global wealth had declined uh, to about 25%, still huge, but not half. Uh, the industrial world had become what was called tripolar, uh, US-based North America, uh, Europe, uh, East Asia, then Japan-based. There was also a very sharp change in the US economy in the 1970s, uh, namely towards uh, financialization and uh, export of production. No time to go into the details, but they're very significant. Uh, what happened is that a variety of factors converged to create a vicious cycle uh, of uh, radical concentration of wealth, uh, mostly in a top fraction of 1% of the population. It's a very small, huge concentration. That means mostly uh, CEOs, um, hedge fund managers, and so on. That's the real source of the tremendous uh, uh, inequality in the United States. It's like a tenth of a percent of the population has an enormous impact on this. Uh, that uh, carries with it concentration of political power. Uh, and that, in turn, uh, leads to development of state policies to increase the concentration. It includes fiscal policies, tax policies designed to that end, uh, rules of corporate governance, uh, deregulation, uh, a lot more. Uh, meanwhile, the same years, the cost of elections skyrocketed, and that has an effect. It drives both political parties 
and much deeper into the pockets of concentrated capital. Uh, it's increasingly financial capital. Now, the Republicans, for them, it's reflexive. The Democrats, who are by now what used to be called moderate Republicans, uh, they're not far behind. Well, while wealth and power, political power, have very narrowly concentrated, thanks to the vicious cycle, uh, for most people, the real incomes have stagnated uh, for about 30 years. Uh, they've been getting by, but with a sharply increased work hours, way beyond Europe now, uh, debt, and uh, asset inflation, uh, which uh, is regularly destroyed by the, the crisis that began as soon as the regulatory apparatus was dismantled. There weren't any as long as the New Deal regu regulatory app apparatus remained in force through the 50s and 60s. Uh, uh, and that's extremely serious. Uh, well, none of this is problematic for the super wealthy. In fact, they benefit from uh, a government insurance policy, which has the name too big to fail. And that's very important. It means the banks and the investment firms, which make virtually no contribution to the actual economy, as far as anyone knows. It's finally beginning to be studied by economists who had looked at it before. Uh, but uh, the banks and the investment firms can make very risky transactions. Make a risky transaction, you get rich rewards. The system's going to crash, inevitably. But when it crashes, uh, they can run to the nanny state, uh, you know, clutching their copies of Hayek and Milton Friedman, and the taxpayer will happily bail them out. That's been the regular process since the Reagan years. And each crisis is more extreme than the last, uh, for the public, that is, and the coming crisis, which is almost inevitable, will probably be still worse. Uh, real unemployment in the United States is literally at the level of the Depression for much of the population. Uh, meanwhile, Goldman Sachs, which is one of the main architects of the current crisis, is richer than ever. Just a couple of weeks ago, it quietly announced $17.5 billion in compensation for last year. Uh, CEO Lloyd Blankfein uh, gets $12.5 million bonus, and his base salary was tripled. I should say that he tripled his base salary, because the rules of corporate governments by the government have been designed so that CEOs can pick the panels that set their salaries with obvious consequences. Uh, well, the uh, same thing's happening in England. Just I've been here a couple of days, every day's front page describes another comparable scandal. Uh, well, it uh, actually wouldn't do to focus attention on such things as these. And accordingly, uh, the propaganda system has to blame others. In the past several months, uh, uh, there's been an interesting propaganda campaign blaming public sector workers. Their fat salaries, exorbitant pensions, and so on, all total fantasy. It's on the model of um, Reaganite imagery of uh, some of you are old enough to recall of uh, black mothers uh, being driven in their chauffeured limousines to welfare offices to pick the checks and so on. Uh, in a culture where lying is honored, you, know, you can get away with this kind of thing. And it has its effects. And there are other models which I need not mention, not very pleasant ones. Uh, the conclusion is we all have to tighten our belts and not all exactly, some exceptions. Uh, teachers are a particularly good tar target, and they're the ones being targeted now. That's part of a deliberate effort, which I think is going on here too, to destroy the public education system. It means from kindergarten right through the universities uh, by privatization in one form or another. Uh, that's, again, fine for the wealthy. It's a disaster for the population. And it's also a disaster for the long-term health of the economy. But that's uh, what's called an externality in economic theory. It's something that's put to the side in decision-making as long as, insofar as market principles prevail. Well, elections have become, in the United States, almost a complete charade. And other countries are sort of following a couple of decades behind. In the US, by now, they're completely run by the public relations industry. Uh, after his 2008 victory, uh, Obama won an award from the advertising industry 
for the best marketing campaign of the year. <laughs> and uh, they understood what was going on, you know, no hope and change. Uh, in the business press, like the Financial Times, uh, executives were, were euphoric. Uh, they described that they had been uh, marketing candidates like uh, toothpaste ever since Reagan, and this was the greatest success they'd ever had. They said it would change the style and corporate boardrooms and so on. Uh, the 2012 election is expected to cost uh, $12 billion. That's mostly corporate funding, of course. There's no other source. And it's not surprising that Obama right now is uh, selecting business leaders uh, for top positions. No other way to get the money. The public is very angry and frustrated. But as long as the Muwasha principle prevails, it doesn't matter. Well, I've barely skimmed the surface of these critical issues, but I don't want to end without at least mentioning another externality that's dismissed in market systems. Uh, that's the fate of the species. That's an externality as far as decisions are concerned. Uh, the financial system is plagued, as well understood, by what's called systemic risk. Uh, namely, it's going to crash if it works the way I described. Uh, and systemic risk is a problem, but it can be remedied. It can be remedied by the taxpayer. But nobody's going to come to the rescue if uh, the environment is destroyed. Uh, that it must be destroyed is virtually an institutional imperative. And it's worth bearing that in mind. Uh, business leaders in the United States are conducting, openly announcing, that they're conducting a massive propaganda campaigns to convince the public that uh, anthropogenic global warming is a liberal hoax. The, uh, and it's having an effect. You can see it in polls. Uh, the executives who are running these campaigns know perfectly well that it's not a hoax. It's very grave. Uh, but uh, they have no option of following that understanding. Uh, in their institutional role, they must ignore that externality and act to maximize profit and market share. If one of them decides not to do it, he's out, and somebody else is in who does do it. These are properties of the institutions, not the individuals. Uh, and uh, this particularly vicious cycle could well turn out to be lethal. Just to see how grave the danger is, you should have a look at the new Congress in the United States, which is uh, propelled into power by business funding and propaganda. Almost all of them are climate deniers. Uh, they've already begun, begun to cut funding for uh, measures that might mitigate environmental catastrophe. And that's likely all to disappear. Uh, worse still, some of them are true believers. Uh, so for example, one of the uh, 